wachten nog even tot we online zijn. Welcome to this launch of Visualizing the Unknown. I'm Geertje Dekkers, I'm your host today. And uh, well, I want to cordially welcome you, all of you here in this room and online uh, at the launch of the project that is funded by NWO and is going to be done by the Huygens ING, uh, the Rijksmuseum Boerhaven and the Bibliotheca Hertziana Max Planck Institute for Art History in Rome with the help of the Royal Society in London and the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. A special welcome to Ellen Pater, brand new PhD that only started this week and has a kickstart. Um, welcome, Ellen. Um, we're going to have a very interesting list of speakers from all the institutions involved, and I can imagine you'll have lots of questions. Please ask them, but at the end, because we're going to have half an hour for questions at the end. Um, for now, I'd like to, gi to give the floor to Amita Amito Haarhuis, director of Rijksmuseum Boerhaven, our host for this afternoon. So welcome everybody in the uh, Rijksmuseum Boerhaven, also especially to Dirk van Meert. On his first day as a director of the Huygens ING, Rijksmuseum Boerhaven is the museum of the history of science and medicine, home to the largest microscope collections in the world, one of the largest microscope collections in the world. Of course, that is a perfect place for the kickoff of this very exciting six-year NWO research project, Visualizing the Unknown, that aims to reenact what the 17th century microscopists saw. Among our top heritage objects are four of only 11 still existing microscopes of Antoni van Leeuwenhoek in the world. It is a very small microscope, but it was a revolutionary step forward. With his microscopes that magnified up to 270 times, he saw things that nobody had seen before. A whole new world opened up, the microcosmos. This totally changed our ideas about the world and had a tremendous impact on our society. But it is not only about what the microscopists saw, but also what they did. How did they interact with nature and make their specimens? How did they interact with each other and with artists? What discussions did they have? This research process laid the foundation for the scientific process as we know it today. Uh, our museum opened up with a whole new permanent presentation in December 2017 that starts with the stories of 17th century scientists and their discoveries and inventions. In 2019, we won the European Museum of the Year Award for our new presentation. Amongst others, uh, and this is from the jury report, for telling the personal stories of those driven by a pursuit of knowledge and giving science a human face. And those stories and the scientific inquiry are never finished. Each discovery leads to more research questions. Thanks to this wonderful collaboration of Rijksmuseum Boerhaven with Huygens ING of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Bibliotheca Hertziana, we will discover more about what the 17th century microscopists saw and did. Stories that will bring our collection to life even more and that will inspire our audiences. Thank you very much. Um, well, let's hear about the background of this project and the way it's uh, come into being by uh, Sitske Franse from, from the Bibliotheca Hertziana and Timen Kokuit 
from the Rijksmuseum Boerhaven, two core members of the team behind visualizing the unknown. Goedemiddag uh, iedereen. Mijn naam is Sietke Fransen. Uh, I should speak in English. Uh, it's very funny. Um, hello everyone. My name is Sietke Fransen. Um, I am um, um, part of the Bibliotheca Hertziana, Max Planck Institute for Art History. And for those of you who don't know that institute that well yet, um, it is a history uh, of art history, uh, especially focusing on Italian uh, history of art and architecture, uh, with new uh, foci points also on uh, global art history and digital art history. Um, and since two years, I'm running a research group at the Biblioteca Herziana on visualizing science in media revolutions. Uh, and with a team of uh, postdocs and predocs, I'm working on questions about how science was visualized, how it was communicated in the whole breadth from the, or the long period from the late Middle Ages until the, and the early modern period, and a reflection also on the digital humanities or a digital time period and how that is helping us and working against us and doing lots of new things to us as historians nowadays. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of this project. Um, and um, this story actually began already um, well, this, the, the, the thoughts about this project began two and a half years ago, um, a little bit earlier even, but there was one day or two days in January that Timon Kokuit from the Boerhave Museum uh, was brought to Cambridge with his colleague Michael Corey from the um, um, Staatliche Museen in um, Dresden, as you can see him here, uh, both of Timon and, and Michael, with uh, Sachiko Kusukawa, um, looking through replica microscopes to look at the uh, Emmanuel College in Cambridge instead of the skies because the weather was so bad that we couldn't uh, actually observe um, the night sky, but we could use the, mic the telescopes to see what was going on, um, how it worked and how sharp and you can, how quickly you can get things uh, close to you. We also looked at a microscope collection of the Whipple Museum in Cambridge, um, and we very soon started to talk about what can we do with these microscopes um, and the material that we were working on in this project, because the project that Sachiko Kusukawa led in Cambridge was the Making Visible project um, on the uh, visual uh, representations of the early Royal Society, 1660 till 1710. Uh, my colleague Katie Reinhardt and I and the team of the Making Visible uh, project catalogued all the images in the archives of the Royal Society. And there are all the letters by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. Um, not only are there the letters and the drawings, but there are also the few specimens that are still left from the 17th century. Um, uh, in that collection. So actually the first time that I started talking about this was when Douglas Anderson and Huib Seidervaert visited the archives of the Royal Society and we were looking through these letters. Um, we, were start we started to think that it would be a very exciting idea to get these uh, or to look at these specimens with the original uh, Leeuwenhoek microscopes. Where can we find those microscopes? Here, of course. So when Tiemann came to Cambridge, I asked him, would it be possible to use the actual original microscopes to look at those specimens? Uh, he said, yes, I guess so. I think it's not very much, a, it's not a big problem. We try and do that. So we spoke to Keith Moore, the archivist of the um, Royal Society, and he was very keen as well. So we managed to bring all of these things together, the specimens, uh, from London to Leiden in the Boerhaven Museum, and what we now call the pilot project of the project that is running now happened in September 2019. Um, in the same premises where we were the, the earlier this week to work on Microlab 1. It was also the first time that we could um, look at the uh, images, as you can see here. This is a cross-section from the bovine nerve or the nerve of a cow. 
uh, drawn by one of the artists working for Anthony van Leeuwenhoek and the original specimens. And it was the first time that Wim van Egmond, microphotographer, came uh, to join our team to make um, pictures of these early specimens. Uh, what you see here is a stock image, so it's not an actually, uh, it's not an image that is made through the microscope, but it's uh, specifically um, made so that we can see as especially good how the specimen is looking at the time. What you can see immediately, it's very dry. Very dry, after more than 300, in, 300 years. Um, so the moment that we were together in that workshop, we started to fantasize what it would be to look at fresh specimens. Um, with the, the, um, the uh, letters of Anthony van Leeuwenhoek um, at the side, how he was making his preparations, which microscopes he was using, what he was seeing and what he was drawing and what his colleagues were, or, or how he was communicating with his colleagues and what his draftsmen uh, were drawing for him. Um, so we kind of started to think what we could do um, there as a sidestep or an important uh, sidestep, I have to say here that we were not the first ones to look at these specimens with um, uh, Leeuwenhoek microscopes. Uh, Brian Ford has looked uh, at the material before. Um, Leslie Robertson, who is here, I think, uh, has been looking at this very specifically, also the things we were looking at earlier this week. Uh, she has managed to, um, to also look at the, um, the bee's uh, eye um, and use the Leeuwenhoek uh, techniques. But there are also entire collections, uh, like the Golub collection uh, in Berkeley, where you can see that they uh, have the, the microscopes of the 17th century, and they already show you a digital image of how the outcome is. If you look through a microscope like this, what the result will be. So there is a, there's a whole group of people interested in this material. Um, and what we are trying to do here is go back to the, what we have results of the scholars of the 17th century. What is left to us nowadays? These are the descriptions and the images. Uh, and these two things we're using to try and understand how they worked, what they saw, and what type of decisions they made uh, and that they think was in important for their colleagues to understand, to know, so that they could tell about these things no one had ever seen before. In that context, we need to go back also a little bit um, in the history of microscopy, which started in the early 17th century. Um, in, um, this is the earliest plate, the earliest image we have of a microscopic observation. Uh, this is a broadsheet um, uh, made by Stelluti and Greuter and Stelluti and, uh, and Chesi in the context of the Academia dei Lincei, uh, 1625. You see the bees, of course, which is the, um, uh, the family um, weapon of the Barbadini. But what you can see at the bottom, let me see if I do this. Yes. What you can see here at the bottom of the plates, the part where people um, don't look very precisely, is all parts, small parts of a bee. And they describe in the text that they have looked at these particular parts of the bee with a microscope. Um, so it is not only that they're showing uh, entire bees um, in such great detail, but they actually so show you small parts um, that has been, uh, have been um, researched with a microscope. Another example here from the um, Italian context, which we will be researching a lot within the broader context of this project, are the original drawings by Martello Malpighi. He sent um, entire volumes full, full of drawings and his manuscripts uh, um, for the uh, descriptions in this case of the dissection of a silkworm, uh, to the Royal Society to be printed. Um, and they had the, all these images engraved on plates and then printed with the actual text. But you see here also again um, the, the kind of macroscopic image of the silkworm first and then smaller details that were done uh, with the use of a microscope. And Marcelo Malpighi was one of the uh, scientists who was drawing himself, like also Jan, Jan Swammerdam, uh, who we will um, encounter later today. But so he was drawing, watching, dissecting, using a microscope, and making these images. And he thought that these were good enough to then show um, to his colleagues. This process is what we are trying to understand here. So out of all of these questions, all this material that is, uh, that is present, um, some colleagues that are really excited, 
we started to have ambitions to, um, to build up an actual project. So what did we do, we, we, what, do we, what did we want? To work with an interdisciplinary team of experts. So that goes from Wim van Egmond, the microphotographer, to people who are understanding the 17th century text, to people who are understanding how uh, dissection worked in the 17th century. Uh, bring these people together and work on the um, 17th century mic microscopic research that was done. So we contacted Erik and said, we have this idea would you be interested? And he said, yes, but then we need to take it broad because we came from the Leeuwenhoek specimens, the Leeuwenhoek letters, and he said, that's great, but there is much more, and we need to incorporate the Dutch context that was happening in which Anthony van Leeuwenhoek was working. Uh, the Dutch context is not an island in itself, so we need to uh, take the entire European context with it. So we did that. In one and a half months, we wrote a proposal. Um, and uh, submitted that in January 2020, got some raving reviews from the board throughout the year, um, um, which eventually um, ended up in getting the funding to do this project. Now, um, I have no idea of time. Okay, I will hurry up. The actual project. Uh, what are we going to do in the next six years? Um, we have research collaboration with these four institutes that were already mentioned, funded by the NWO, Huygens ING, Rijksmuseum Boerhaven, Bibliotheca Hertziana, collaborative partners, the Royal Society and the Rijksmuseum. We have a fantastic board of trustees who are helping us, um, supporting us, uh, answering questions that we don't know. Sachiko Kusukawa, Pamela Smith, Jan de Hond, uh, Keith Moore, Matthew Cobb, Anne-Sophie Lehmann, and Kay Etheridge. I can explain you better who they are, what they do uh, in the questions, during the questions. But I want to show you now what are the different parts of the research that we're going to do in these next six years. First of all, very important, key part of the um, uh, center core of the project are the micro lamps that we started earlier this week, this week which are reenactments of microscopic experiments. This is taking place here. Um, the, uh, the project runs um, uh, with Timon Kokuit as one of the, uh, of the leaders. There are two more curators from the Boerhaven Museum, in, Museum involved, Mineke Tehennepe and Tim Huisman. Uh, Wim van Egmond is a uh, core member there. Ellen Pater, our new uh, PhD student. Uh, of course, Erik Jorink himself. Um, and we are working together as the core to make this work. But already this last week, we invited uh, Frank van Kampen, who is an expert in making the making of historical uh, specimens, of historical preparations, which we realized immediately is of the greatest essence to be able to do any of this work, this work. Because if we don't understand how these specimens were made or how you can make them, we cannot see anything. Uh, and we had also the luck this week to work with Hans Huibrechts, who is an entomologist from the uh, um, uh, Naturalis Museum here, also in Leiden, and actually knew everything about bees and the dissection of bees. So we really brought together these um, experts, which we, which we will do in the future as well. Second part of this project is a four-year PhD um, project that is um, um, Ellen Pater, who is this, um, uh, going to do this. Uh, she, is working, she is going to work on the process from drawing via print and dissemination to the impact of these images, and she is going to specify exactly what she's going to do in the next month. Um, um, the postdoc, uh, of two years postdoc, uh, will be supervised by Emma Her Irma Hermans, uh, and she is actually, uh, or the, the postdoc, we don't know who this is yet, will start later in uh, 2022 and is supposed to, to compare images with other novel 17th century techniques of representation and will specifically look at the object as a representation that is also important within the whole narrative. The societal impact and public outreach of this project um, has, there's a lot of different things we're going to do. There's an exhibition here at the Rijksmuseum uh, opening in 2023 around the meaning of Anthony van Leeuwenhoek's microscopy from the start in the 17th century till now. There's an exhibition at the Rijksmuseum Onder Kruipselen or Creepy Crawlers uh, opening in September 2022. Um, the first workshop is going to be in Rome, uh, the Bibliotheca Hertziana, on microscopes and illustrations or illustrators in the 17th century. Um, and in 2023, there's a big international conference at the Royal Society in London around the 300th anniversary of the death of Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. 
So there are all these different parts that are moments that we can bring people together, that we can um, talk to, uh, to experts, to, um, to audiences, and actually um, learn and go on with, and go further with the research that we're doing also in this academic context. Outputs. Dissertation from Ellen, uh, articles by the postdocs, articles based on the microlabs, a coffee table book for a wider audience um, um, based on the uh, fantastic uh, images that we have from the uh, historical part and the, the new material that, um, that Wim is um, making, and um, a synthetic um, uh, monograph uh, written by our PI, Erik Joring, who is bringing everything together. Then, um, to give you a bit more um, in-depth information about the microlabs, we're doing six. Uh, we started this week, we started with bees because bees have been researched by all these microscopists um, in the 17th century. Um, they are always used to, uh, to because they, they were seen as important creatures, having a democracy, etc. they were also interested in how they looked from the inside. Mm -hmm. um, we did it, we will show you images um, uh, later this afternoon. The next one is silkworms, uh, partly because Martello Mar Malpighi sent an entire manuscript on silkworms. Uh, Swammerdam has been really interested in um, this, this, this section of silkworms. And what we do with every one of these microlabs is um, finding topics that are central to the micro microscopy in the 17th century and that give us the opportunity to compare different um, microscopies at the time so that we can understand what their um, visual image was, what their understanding of the topic was, and how they were communicating about this. Um, and not having the, so we don't need to focus only on one author, we can really compare and see uh, methods of dissection, etc. Bodily fluids, from blood till semen to uh, scrapings of the tongue, central to one of them, uh, the microscopic world, see, seeing bacteria, um, plants is the fifth um, uh, topic of the uh, microlabs, plants and, and potentially also corals. The sixth one is still quite open, but we are uh, hoping to uh, focus specifically on the drawing techniques that were used in all these various, um, by all these various uh, scientists and their draftsmen. And now I finally give the word to Timon. Thank you. Thank you, Siska. <coughs> As Cisco already mentioned, this is a six-year project, so it's very broad. We have the luxury to study the 17th century microscopy in depth. Uh, part of this, the first stage of this, are the microlabs, of one year of fiddling around with microscopes, with drawings, with observations, which is fun to do. And in fact, I'm very happy and honored that we managed to give these the outcome of this practical workshop, the importance that it may have as source material. They're not just nice illustrations, they're really what you see through these microscopes the, and experiences we have. They are really fundamental to understanding 17th century microscopy as a whole. So I'm ha very happy that this happened at the beginning of this project. In fact, up, to yes up till yesterday evening, uh, we have been working very, very hard on this very inspiring first microlab on bees. And in fact, while making up this PowerPoint, we were collecting our research questions. And each time we realized that yesterday and Tuesday, we already found brilliant answers and also more questions to the research questions we envisaged in this project. So we had a really wonderful start, but it was a bit uh, tiring. <coughs> Because, of course, it is um, nice to fiddle with microscopes. This is, we are in a museum, we take really care of our collection, but we also try to contextualize it, to study it. And that also means investigating the objects. It's nice that you can play with microscopes, but we have specific uh, questions to ask, specific points of attention. I want to address these specific points of attention. Of course, one of these, if we bring this collection to life, um, let's look at lighting techniques. Wim van Egmond is an expert in this. By light, you can do so much with your observation that you otherwise lose if you just take a standard microscope lens. And in fact, if we look at 17th century descriptions, there are clear markers about this. Anthony van Leeuwenhoek says that he do, does his observations in a dark room facing an open door because that gives you the ideal aperture, the ideal light to make this observation, and it truly affects outcome. This is from the pilot in 2019, when experimenting with uh, the original samples, and you can see already brilliantly how 
transmitted light and reflected light on the samples, it means so much. And this is really something to pursue further to see how it compares with the original observation drawings. So this is perhaps a very basic uh, variable that we want to uh, study, but there are much, much more. Our microscopes have been studied in the past before, and this I don't want to downplay this work. Uh, what you see on the left is a very <laughs> complex graph. It is the resolving power, the definition that several historical microscopes uh, possess, made up by Van Sitter, curator of Utrecht's collection of, of microscopes. And you see here what is plotted, there's magnification, there's how good, how of detail these microscopes show. And here the L is the Van Leeuwenhoek microscope. So what this graph essentially says is that the Van Leeuwenhoek microscope performs better than many 18th century microscopes, and it's only being surpassed by 19th century achromatic microscopes. And this is a very scientific metric to study microscopes. You look at how much definition it resolves, and that tells you something about how much one is able to uh, observe through these microscopes. But that's not the entire story. And this is helpful, but I must uh, uh, stress again, this is a, this is a first one-dimensional uh, approach to performance. Here you see one of the Musenbroek microscopes in the Boerhaver collection. It resolves 2.8 micrometers. That's nearly as good as the sum of the Leeuwenhoek. So that's a metric for choosing what microscopes uh, you want to use. Now, if we take, we bring these microscopes to usage, it's a completely different story. And uh, I want to already hint at one of the images that Wim will be previewing later this afternoon. It's uh, an image of a bee image through Musenbroek microscopes and the entire idea of sharpness and fuzziness. It's really, it's so, such a complex image that one sees. That already shows that uh, through reconstruction with these microscopes, it really reveals so much more than these otherwise brilliant studies of microscopes. There's much more to scientific, uh, to 17th century microscopy. Another instance, this is uh, <coughs> hinting at some research that uh, we've we done uh, a few years ago. By not only looking at uh, progress in lens grinding techniques, but also at technological domains into which lenses were produced. Um, together with Marvin Bolt and Michael Corey, we managed, and um, motivated by Erik Jorink, in fact, we had a look at the lenses, the flamework lenses at Johannes Hudde, one of the uh, not very well-known uh, scholars of the 17th century that he uh, developed. And in the 1660s, by not grinding lenses, but by flame working them in this manner, this is an 18th century description of it, Hudde managed to bring out a completely new method of making lenses. And what we concluded in our study of this is that, is that in one step, you have high resolution, high magnification microscopy, accessible to anyone, you don't need a lens grinder. And there is a correlation between this happening in 1660 and the blossoming Dutch culture of microscopy in the second half of the 17th century. But this still is only optics. Now, if we compare this to sources, we are uh, focusing again on higher magnifications. Let's see what Van Leeuwenhoek tells us about this. In my opinion, glasses of extreme smallness, so very high magnifications, they're not suitable for making important discoveries. So here already a 17th century scholar tells us that magnification is only one aspect of it that's much more complex. And in fact, sometimes you want to, you choose low magnifications. So we went to, we took this as one of the aspects of our microlabs to also look at perhaps the internal history of our microscopes, except uh, 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 in addition to the uh, context of 17th century microscopy. And this came back immediately. We went into, we looked into a very vague description from the 1620s of one of the first microscopes uh, by written by the Pedesque. This is to illustrate how vague these descriptions can be. This is a depiction, a drawing of this microscope by Drebbel, by Beekman in a copy of his letters. Uh, it's the first illustration of a microscope ever recorded in history, and trying to reconstruct a microscope like this from this source material, it's difficult. But we did find enough markers to see that already Drebbel and Peresk, and eventually this ended up with Stelluti and Chesi in Rome, they already had high magnification at their disposal, but still it didn't boom, still it didn't. So magnification, it just jumps over during the entire 17th century. And for some reason, this wasn't seen as, a, as, as, as an opening up of this world. 
also illustrated by, uh, here you see Eric. Um, we started this microlab uh, deliberately by working with uh, single lens microscopes, uh, bad magnifiers, uh, easy, well, simple microscopes. And I remember looking through this microscope, this particular low magnification magnifying glass. I looked at the bee and I imagined, this is all I want to see from a bee. I mean, I see everything about this bee that I always wanted to know. Why would there be anything more that I want to get to know of this bee? And this is before embarking on compound microscopes, high magnification. So it also shows us that to, to a 17th century practitioner, it wouldn't have been immediately obvious that even more is hidden further down into the sample. This is a Van Musselmerup microscope, single lens microscope um, from our collections. And I think the entire team, Mineke, Tim, Sietzke, Eric, uh, Wim, we agreed that this is the perfect microscope. And this was quite of a surprise because it, it's, it's not as good as the Leeuwenhoek's given by this one metric, but it's so flexible, it's so easy. It gives you a three-dimensional view of your subject. You have the entire context. You understand the reference that your observation has with the rest of it. It's flexible, uh, it's easy to adjust, and you feel that you are still involved with your specimen, that you're mani manip manipulating nature. If we then take the best microscopes of the 17th century, some compound long tubes you see over here, they're better in magnification, perhaps they're better in their solution, perhaps not. But I remember Sietzkuli having a first look through one of these microscopes, and the first thing she said is, ooh, I don't like this microscope. Why? Because you don't, you, you lose any reference of your sample with all the rest. I mean, you look at an object, at a, an image that one doesn't understand. Um, you have more artifacts. So there is a preference, just by using it, there's a preference for certain designs that you wouldn't get to know from looking at the optics alone. And that's also when we further delve into the sources. Here we have a Swammerdam drawing, and we think we managed to find out that Swammerdam most likely used these types of micro uh, Muslimbrook microscopes, among others. And it really got us wondering about the interplay bet between scholars doing observations, finding out new dissection techniques, having specific criteria for observation, and instrument makers developing these microscopes. So this is really something to look into further about how scholars and instrument make makers interacted in these essential stages of the 17th century, perhaps leading to preparation microscopes, dissection mi microscopes. To, to conclude, we feel that a further study of the instruments alone, the microscopes alone, the most fruitful path to be this was, would be to look through preparation techniques, because it is preparation techniques that dictate how the instrument should perform, what instrument is suitable or not. And this is from two days of work, so good results. These two people you see on the left, Hans Huybrechts and Frank van Kampen, they have proved to be invaluable, absolutely essential to this project. Initially, we thought that with historians and, my, and photographers, we would manage to access 17th century microscopical practice, but we were wrong. Uh, preparation is key to it. We are very happy to have these two experts on board of our team. Uh, we also cut and made preparations ourselves. Here you see Sietzke slicing off a bee's eye yesterday morning successfully. Um, how would this approach, reconstruction, reenactment, gives you more access to 17th century microscopy? After all, we're not 17th century scholars. We're not experienced in this. We don't have the contextual background. But still, we feel that this is very valuable into accessing, into better understanding in the entire context of 17th century microscopy. Reenactment is a more current topic in the history of science. We have, for instance, on the uh, left, you see Pamela Smith making a knowing project where she studies alchemical recipes by looking into 17th century texts. And we have closer to home uh, Sven Dupré's Artechne uh, project in which he studies art and the technique of art by looking at reconstructing 17th and 16th century processes. There's two aspects to this. Why this method would be fruitful for studying 17th century uh, microscopy and microscopical practice. Uh, the first is from the work by, pa by Pamela Smith. Um, we are, <coughs> what we have from the sources are some uh, preparations, very little. 
we have visual material, we have end results, and we have descriptions, but it's hard to access these descriptions. Now, Pamela already wrote by looking at 16th century alchemical texts, through re reenactment, in fact, reenactment was required to make sense of these manuscripts. You couldn't understand these descriptions of, that were uh, handed over to us. You couldn't understand them truly without actually doing this. And this also holds for the descriptions by, of Swammerdam, the instructions of Swammerdam of von Leeuwenhoek on how he made the specimens. By reenacting it within its limitations, you really gain more, a little more access into what's actually being said and what's actually being stated. But the other aspect is the, <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> knowledge that is embedded in these practices. More than anyone else, we realized that by making preparations, by following these descriptions, you're really manipulating nature. It's not observing nature, it's manipulating it to a certain more and more to a certain extent until it um, meets your research requirements. And in this embodied knowledge is, the, is, the, is so essential to 17th century microscopical context. In fact, you can say that in, this, in these techniques, this knowledge is available, and this is how it eventually ends up in these drawings. This is a 17th century drawing that shows us that where Swammerdam wants to tell us something about the bee, and this is such a complex image in which all these preparation steps are embedded. This is staged, this is not nature, this is staged nature in order to fit a research context. Thank you. Sitzke takes over for now. If a few more things here, then, then we, we have finished really. But it's, I think this image and the thing that we've done in the last two days are really showing uh, some, some really useful insights in the whole process of understanding um, how these images came, uh, came to be. So what Pamela Smith has been doing is looking at a manuscript and go back and try to make the, um, the, do the recipes and understand how they were done. What we're looking at, what we're dealing with is the results, the visual results of uh, uh, microscopic experiments. Um, so we are also thinking backwards and what, how did this image come, uh, come, come to be? Um, what, did the, what did Jan Swammerdam actually see so that he could draw this? And what we realized, what we already knew um, in a way is that for, uh, to make an image like this, you have to look through a microscope many, many times because most of the time you see a small part of it. So to get the full image of the entire head of a bee, you need to look several times. So it is a compound image. But actually we realize it's more than that. It's not only a compound image in the sense that, it, that he had, had to have looked many times through a microscope, but he also put it, he intonated, he put it as a scene. This is not what he saw. He had one part of a bee, or he took one eye of a bee, or many eyes of a bee, actually, that he looked at many, many times so that he could draw the uh, right side of the eye. Then he used many other eyes uh, that he cut open and looked from the inside to see the actual uh, parts that are on the inside of the, of the eye. So he ha and then he put this together in this image uh, to, to make it look like this beautiful and very uh, symmetric um, uh, head of a bee. So there is a lot of manipulating going on in the drawing, uh, which is already, I think, um, um, shaking the definition that is often given for epistemic images, that it is a representation of an object. Because it, it is, in a certain way, but it is strongly, strongly manipulated. So are we seeing nature here as it was seen, or is it a completely manipulated thing? So this is already a starting point of, of uh, critical thinking about um, the, the, the literature on, on epistemic images, on objects, etc. Uh, one final slide uh, we wanted to show you. Um, this is an image of, um, uh, the left image is a uh, illustration from Robert Hooke's Micrographia from 1665, uh, and it shows cork. Um, and this image, this photograph on the, on the right is an image made by Wim van Egmond uh, in the pilot two years ago, um, looking through an original uh, Leeuwenhoek microscope uh, on um, an actual uh, original Leeuwenhoek specimen of cork. Um, what was Leeuwenhoek doing here? Uh, he was experimenting, he wanted to see how cork was looking. However, he was not only doing that, he was using visual markers, visual calibration points that were uh, Robert Hooke's in his micrographia. He, namely, Robert Hooke had seen this 
already. So that was his uh, calibration point to then look at himself and see what he was seeing and then being able to draw that. And this is again very important because we need to understand that all these microscopists saw things that they'd never seen before. And therefore, all the other colleagues who were corresponding with them with visual material helped them, giving these uh, f starting points. Like, okay, he has seen that. Most, most of them are men. So he has seen this. Let's have a look at this as well. Can I see the same? No, I see some di something different. How can I explain this? Etc. So it is this visual communication between the scientists in the 17th century that we are using as our starting point for this entire project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think you've made us all, or at least me, very curious about the outcomes of your microlabs and a little bit jealous of the work you do. Um, Sitzke and Tiemann ended with the staging and manipulating of observations and pictures, and I think Erik Jorink is going to delve deeper in that, into that. He's the leader of this project, uh, he's from uh, Huygens ING and Leiden University, and he's going to explain us how you come from observations to publications. I think I will, uh, Martin, I think I will use this mic. Is that okay? Yes, uh, okay, wonderful. Okay, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here in Museum, Rijksmuseum Boerhaven. Thank you, Amito, for hosting this uh, meeting. And those people who are watching us online or later, this will be taped and put on YouTube, so everyone who's uh, interested in the project could view it at the later stage. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here, also because it's a kind of uh, seal on processes that have been going on for years, including the rapprochement, I should say, between the history of science and art history, between academia and uh, institutions for cultural heritage, heritage. And we're very pleased that this is kind of, uh, I could say, the crown on the work that people like Sitzke, Tiemann, and also the, the project in Cambridge have done before, and I'm very glad that, uh, for example, it could also from a different angle be considered as a follow-up to the uh, conference, uh, Huygens Institute and the Royal Dutch Academy of Science and the Rijksmuseum, hosted in 2016, called Art and Science in the Early Modern Low Countries, which was kind of also kind of game changer, so to speak, which included many curators from the university as well as academics. So it brought this world, these two worlds actually in more close contact. Anyway, what I want to want to discuss today is not only the specific of this project, but the, also the larger impact, the larger meaning, the larger implications, if you want. Because to us it seems quite obvious that an academic publication or in a more broader sense, a visualization of scientific insights contains an image or whatever, and I'll just start right around the corner here, uh, a couple of hundred meters from here. This is Krein, meet Krein. Krein is uh, a reconstruction of the Neanderthaler, which was found uh, uh, a couple of years ago on the Doggersbank. There's an exhibition at the Rijksmuseum now, and two famous um, uh, reconstructors of archaeological finders, the Kenneth and Kenneth twins, a more suitable name could hardly be imagined, managed to make this reconstruction. And this brings us right at the core of our project and the broader implications of this project to see is, we hope, to understand. A thousand words could not say as much as one single 
image. And just to give you an, a, a couple of examples how this works in practice, um, this is from The Guardian. Uh, support The Guardian is my advice. Um, massive human head in Chinese well forces scientists to rethink evolution. And here's an image of the skull and what we see here, and this is a very interesting dragon man in his habitat. Photograph, nay, note, photograph, <laughs> Chang Zhao. Uh, first note that it's always a man, caveman, and his wife, and that this picture is presented as completely unproblematic. This is how cavemen look like. And to speak for the, the uh, universal, if not cosmic, uh, attention, importance connected to uh, the power of images, I go to another example. Um, it, this I remember from my childhood. When I was nine years old, I was completely fascinated by NASA and the first walk on the moon and so on. And this was launched in uh, uh, 16, uh, 1972, the Pioneer 10 and 11, which were kind of programmed that they would go out of our, our uh, solar system and possibly meet some alien life beyond our solar system. And the basic idea was that if those people, those aliens would capture this pioneer, these pioneer satellites, it would be clear, immediately clear to them that caveman and his wife <laughs> were habiting somewhere else in the atmosphere. And note that, the, the, as the Wikipedia says, uh, it was designed by Carl Sagan and crafted by his wife. So to make this quite clear how uh, uh, the, the whole issue of uh, uh, gender also can play a role in this particular field of inquiry. Um, just the last uh, example, uh, headlines a couple of years ago, the first time a black hole is being captured on a photograph and all around the world in all kinds of media uh, this image was, or many of some more images were displayed, uh, for example in the high Tech scientific journal, uh, the astrophysical journal newsletter, in which more or less the uh, uh, Shep Duleman, uh, who's leader of this, this project, and I, you can also watch his press conference on uh, YouTube, and I checked it just a couple of days ago. He literally says, We have the first photograph of a black hole. Well, this immediately captures your attention. But the whole issue, how this picture, it's a picture, it's an image, it's not a photograph, is construed, is not touched upon at all. You should read between the lines of those papers to kind of deduce how they managed to construct this particular image, which brings us right at the core of our project. Um, there's an elephant, there's still an elephant in the room, uh, despite a very strict QR uh, control at the beginning, and this is, of course, our uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, and this is kind of what this project is really about, because everyone knows the, the, uh, the COVID virus. Uh, one and a half year ago, this epidemic was kind of spreading, news was spreading, and even before scientists figured out what it exactly was, what kind of uh, virus, what its implications were, how contagious it was, and so on, there was already circulating this immediately iconic image of the coronavirus. Um, I found this very fascinating. Uh, as the, because there are many, there's some conflicting or overlapping representations from this, from this one, but this is immediately became the image of the epidemic. And um, 
I was fascinated by it, so I immediately tried to find out who made it. And it was, uh, there were two uh, bio artists from uh, the CDC, the institution by the famous Dr. Fauci, uh, Alessa Eckhart and Dan Eggins, uh, and who say in an interview, um, that the Center for uh, Disease Control and the uh, Prevention say, we rely on illustrations to help clarify the message, break up the content, and enhance comprehension. And the both artists who created it, they used a microscopic close-up of the virus and manipulated it with artistic means so it could serve in public awareness campaigns, bringing, I quote, bringing the unseeable into view. Uh, well, they were very uh, successful in this, as you <laughs> might uh, see everyone within days immediately, without having deeper knowledge of the coronavirus, knew what it was about. And if you delve deeper in the literature, uh, uh, especially uh, Eckhart, uh, explains why, how she manipulated the microscopic image with shadows, with the spiky bulbs, who kind of resonate the, the, the shape of those uh, sea mines. But there are also other uh, associations. Uh, the coronavirus was named after uh, the corona, uh, the crown in antiquity. And there's already a kind of iconographical debate going on how you should fit this into deeper traditions. And this brings, he, brings us to the core of this project, namely that the people we are discussing had no, repeat, no uh, template to work from. So everyone in the 17th century knew how an elephant should look like or look like without ever having seen an elephant. But the people we are discussing didn't know where to look what they could expect, how they should interpret it, how they should visualize that, how they should bring to their peers, and how the public would uh, respond on this. Is this exactly, those are exactly the same issues as with regard to the coronavirus, of course. And um, this brings us to, this is from emerging infectious diseases. This brings us to uh, what is the backbone of this project, the whole issue of scientific communication. This project is about more than re-enacting, reverse engineering extremely important macroscopical observation, but it uh, is at the core of the whole scientific process, which as we understand it now, goes from observation, and we have seen how problematic this could be, to representation. And the last two days, as Sietzke and Timon already indicated, have shown us how extremely difficult it is to observe and to represent what you see. And Wim will uh, show some examples uh, right after my talk. Uh, then the results are brought to Peer review. This is a practice going back to 60, 60, 60, 70, most notably the circle of the Royal Society. Uh, then in publication, once again, the Royal Society is of importance here um, as being the editor of one of the first scientific journals, the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And there, there's this whole process of dissemination. Um, what this project actually also is about is to process this whole chain of events with the microscopic world as a kind of test case. And here we're building on work that earlier has been done, including, for example, the beautiful projects at uh, Cambridge University uh, led by uh, our deeply esteemed colleague, uh, Sashiko Kuzukawa. Um, just give an example. This was published in 1704 in the Philosophical Transactions, which, which is a rotifer. Do I pronounce it correct? correct? Timon? Rotifer, rotifer uh, in the Philosophical Transactions. A kind of 
microscopical but not too tiny little animal. During the research, this seems a self-evident image, but we were, of course, and we are still interested in the backgrounds. Uh, during her research, uh, Sitzke stumbled, oh, I'm going the wrong direction, on the original image. And during the earlier mentioned pilot, uh, Wim van Egmond made, through an original van Leeuwenhoek microscope, microscope, the following observation. So here we got some parts of the whole process of observing, drawing, bringing it into print. Which brings me to the um, hypothesis underlaying, as one of the, the, the pillars under this project, that today's procedures, including manipulating kind of uh, uh, constructing Image in images in order to bring abroad the most clear message, those procedures were largely shaped in the 1670s, uh, triggered by new media, in this case uh, the philosophy of the, 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 the scientific journal. Uh, and it's very interesting to, to kind of make a connection with today's uh, visual culture, especially uh, on Instagram. There, there are some very interesting similarities here. Um, and we look, as uh, mentioned, at observational techniques of which the micro labs are a very our key under, uh, undertaking. The visual item used, the whole idea of peer review, how do you convince your peers that what you see is actually what you could see. Uh, Well-known examples are, of course, of Van Leeuwen, who sent his microscopical observations to the Royal Society, and they would not publish it, publish them, because they could not uh, repeat them. And Van Leeuwen famously held his cards against his chest. Uh, and we will also study the whole issue of the scientific journal. Besides, and uh, Sitzke already mentioned that uh, besides uh, the important uh, all overtowering figure of uh, Van Leeuwenhoek, we will some study some other microscopists of name, including, and I'm working on the Huygens Institute, including Christian Huygens, who, much to my surprise, uh, whose microscopical work has not been studied at all, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, we have some knowledge of his work in the 1650s, but in the late 70s, 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 80s, he once again took up his microscopical observations, including jotting all kinds of drawings and doodles in his texts. And there are many other intriguing figures. We should not specifically not only focus on Van Leeuwenhoek. This is a whole community of discourse with people knowing each other, cooperating, hating each other, as in the case of Swammerdam and Van Leeuwenhoek, but basically working in the same discourse, verbally and visually commenting upon each other's work. Um, with regard to the uh, visual representation, um, there are many strategies which uh, Ellen is uh, hopefully going to analyze in detail. How do you represent something? Sitzke already uh, pointed at the fact that uh, it's very difficult to look through a microscope and even more difficult to kind of sketch, to make first to make sense of it and then to kind of sketch it. If you are, and that, that was what we stumbled, stumbled upon yesterday, if you are convinced that the facets of a bee's eye are circular, you see circles, and if your a priori is that they're, they're hexagonal, you see hexagons. And this is really an extremely important thing. All images that we see are preconceived constructions. And there are all kinds of visual techniques, as, as for example in the case of Swammerdam, who on the uh, vertical 
axis here depicts the stage-like development of, in this case, allows, and on the horizontal axis zooms in on the microscopical level. So you got a kind of graph here uh, displaying the um, <coughs> growth of the Laos. Uh, Swamardam, as I said, a very intriguing uh, figure, and I think it's about time that I finish the biography, I think, but uh, first we have to include the results of the, field of the, the micro labs here. Um, he kept improving up his, upon his own observations, so he, uh, on the basis of this in 1669, he made new observations which he glued on his previous observations, and then later, those were, oh, I guess you skipped one thing. Uh, this, and this also brings us to the, to the issue of publication. This was not published during Sommerdam's lifetime. These were only published uh, nearly half a century later after his death. Um, this is the Laos. Uh, which is recognizable, but I'm quite sure you won't recognize what this is. Um, to the left, we see, uh, some of you might have noticed that this is the inter gastrointestinal duct of the female Laos, and to the right, we see the female reproductive system. And as Swammerdam uh, writes in his clarification, oh, I'm sorry, what writes in his clarification, to make the thing clear, this is how the female ovarium looks like in life, and this is kind of spread it out for making clear how the structure is. Well, we managed, uh, we tried, uh, Hans tried to dissect a queen bee yesterday, and I can assure you it's a pretty mess what you find inside. To make sense of this is extremely extremely difficult, which once again uh, stresses at the importance that the immediately, these were the take home messages from uh, the last day's workshops, preparations are extremely important, uh, your mindset is extremely important, and the, uh, the way you present it. And this brings me to what is basically already implicit in the quote I gave from the CDC, from Alyssa Eckhart, those images are not, as Sitzke already mentioned, epistemic images in the sense of Lorraine Destin, but those are constructions made, construed to kind of convince the peers and the general audience who could not control those uh, images. Um, this one is very famous, and then I'm at the end of my talk, uh, this is the anatomy of a Laos, uh, which is, this is a well-known quote, but it's beautiful and it's repair, uh, worth repeating in full because only, usually only the first line is uh, quoted, but it's worth looking at the rest of it. I hereby present you the almighty finger of God, writes Swammerdam to his friend Teveno, in the anatomy of a Laos, in which you will find miracles heaped upon miracles. The lines of Apelles, so the famous uh, Greek painter, the lines of Apelles are admired by all the world, but here you will discover in one part of one line the complete structure of all the most ingenious animals in the entire universe together. What people, my lord, are capable of understanding this? Yet what artist can there be other than God who could in any way investigate and depict it? And this is a very rhetorical remark because the implication is that the only one beside God who could do this was Johannes Swammerdam himself. <laughs> Let it be very clear. He was, as usually presented in the literature, he's not a kind of madman. He was very conscious of his own talents and abilities. And we will show you some examples of, of this. Uh, having seen the original drawings and the mess we basically found under our microscopes makes clear that he's an extremely gifted uh, uh, preparator of anatomical specimens, an extremely uh, talented observer and a draftsman as well. So let me finish by uh, 
give by stressing the importance of publications. Um, Van Leeuwenhoek is very well known because he published so much. Sommerdam is more or less forgotten also because of the fact that this impressive work remained unpublished after his death for more than half a century. So it was only, his, his life work was only published halfway the 18th century, while it was finished in 1680. Um, this included, for example, the new elaborated image of the Laos. And let me finish by, perhaps you could keep this image of the Laos in your mind. And on a, a day a couple of years ago, uh, I walked through uh, this beautiful museum and my eyes stumbled uh, upon this. This is the so-called Kramer microscope, made the, according to the catalog of the museum around 1740. And as you know that the Bijbel der Natuur by Swammerdam was published in 1737, 1730. Eight, you might immediately recognize this as a reference, a visual and also a textual reference to the work of Swammerdam. Here you see the finger of God, look to the right, the finger of God pointing to somebody who is doing anatomical or microscopical observations through a microscope. And this, besides being a very interesting Example, it also shows the kind of intermateriality, intervisual connections, the interplay at the meta level, blah, 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 and so on, of the project we are just about to start. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much for introducing us to the importance and the complications involved in making choices and making images. Um, I think it's time to see something of the actual material the people we've been talking about might have seen. It's going to, uh, you've already seen some of it, some work by Wim van Egmond. Um, He's going to show us more, I think, of the last couple of days, too. So please listen to uh, the awarded micro photographer and researcher for this project, Wim van Egmond. Thank you. I have to switch uh, to the computer, so I need a little time. And that's because I have some movies, and I don't use PowerPoint for movies, because that doesn't work that well. Thank you. Try to do it as quickly as possible. My keyword, yeah. So, and let's start here. I have a VLC player. Uh, so, um, yeah, my name is Wim van Egmond. I'm a, uh, I've, yeah, I'm a sort of in-between artist. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an artist. But I did art school and I studied painting at art school in Rotterdam, and I've always been interested in scientific imaging. Um, and this is the type of images that um, I observed in books when I was at art school and I made paintings like this. But then I thought, well, perhaps it's better to buy a microscope myself and start doing stuff like this myself. This is Ernst Haeckel, uh, one of the yeah, famous microscopists. Uh, he popularized microbes and uh, made these beautiful illustrations. Actually, they're not that accurate. Um, so I started making drawings myself. So this, these are desmids. 
uh, freshwater algae, and I try to make a sort of modern approach. I observe them through the microscope, and they, the micro microscope gives a sort of optical section. So I thought, well, I go through these optical sections and I try to recreate the three-dimensional shapes in my mind uh, to um, create these shapes of these algae. Uh, so these are indeed uh, reconstructions from what I've observed through the microscope. Uh, this is a copper pot uh, from the sea. Uh, I spent a week on this uh, organism, and that's, of course, too much. So I skipped the drawing, and I started to become a microphotographer. So now, uh, the past 25 years, uh, I've been making, or 28 years, I've been making portraits of microbes. So um, this is a plankton organism from the sea. I just gives you a little bit of an example of what microbes look like under the microscope. Under, mother, under modern microscopes, they're all 1970s uh, discarded laboratory instruments because as an artist you are poor, so you can't... Uh, so this is paramecium. This is an amoeba eating a paramecium. <laughs> Everything is eating each other. This is a desmid, it's a green algae, or an algae. And this is a rotifer eating the desmid. <laughs> yeah, so everything is eating each other. Um, well, and we're slowly getting towards Anthony van Leeuwenhoek because um, Eric already showed the, the picture of the rotifer. Rotifers are the smallest animals. Um, this is a tiny rotifer. And van Leeuwenhoek was, of course, the first to observe the rotifer. He also observed the rotifer, there's a rotifer on the right. Uh, and the green blobs, or spheres, is a volvox, it's a colony of green algae, also observed by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek for the first time. And this um, is the most important organism on the planet, a cyanobacterium. Uh, we wouldn't be there uh, uh, with, if, if there were no cyanobacteria. And this happens to be the first microbe ever described by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek in 1674. And he caught it here. And this is the Berkelsemeer. And I happen to live right there on the right. The lake is uh, already drained a long time ago. Um, but I live at the exact spot where the micro world was discovered by Anthony Vallewoek. So that's why they had to ask me for <laughs> participating in this project. So the past um, days we started, we already started, this is the kickoff, but yeah, in fact we already were are playing a little bit with this project already. We started with using a Mussenbrook uh, microscope observing the bee. And what you notice is that you get a very hazy image, but the resolution is quite uh, superb. This is a bee's head. Impaled, of course. It's, yeah. uh, I also made some films of the dissecting, but I thought, well, perhaps we should not show that because they're quite horrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is the sting of the bee, uh, prepared by um, Hans Huibrechts. Um, uh, Frank and Hans are colleagues of mine. I'm, um, you could consider me as a sort of amateur microscopist. Uh, I'm actually chairman of the Dutch micro uh, Amateur Microscopy Club, and Frank was chairman of the Antwerp. So we are so, sort of a um, team of friends, and there's a whole community of amateur microscopists who are very into uh, Van Leeuwenhoek and the old guys, because amateurs have to make all their stuff themselves. They make their own gear, and so they're quite close to that 17th century microscopist in the, the fact that they're always tweaking, so that's why I th think we should try to get the whole international amateur microscopy uh, people. Okay, so uh, this is a movie I made through the Hudder, uh, no, through the, uh, from Musselbroek lenses. This is um, with a, yeah, with a little bit higher magnification. Oh, I made a sort of clip. Uh, this is the bee's leg. This is where they collect uh, the pollen on. You already see how extremely detailed the images are, although a little bit hazy. The mouth parts of the bee, 
And now we are switching towards the Van Leeuwenhoek microscope. And then you can, and they have about the same magnification. You saw that uh, that was the switch. And you see this one has much more contrast, which makes it easier to, to, um, yeah, to, to see the smallest details. So the, I think uh, in resolution they're comparable, uh, but the Van, Mus uh, Van Musselbroek microscope, yeah, it's so hazy, it's almost impossible to see these fine de details. So here we are. And I'm moving the, um, the specimen under the, the little microscope. And what you, could, what you also um, could see is that you get a sort of parallax view. You, saw, you, you get a three-dimensional, um, yeah, here you can see it. It's almost as if you're, it, it becomes three-dimensional, as if you're um, only a couple of millimeters above the specimen and flying over the specimen. And here you see the pollen. This is the pollen blob on the hind leg. Uh, Timon dissected uh, a little part of the eye. And I switch here from uh, transmitted light to, uh, so light from above and um, light from underneath to show. And what we were trying to see, can we see these little hexagonal shapes? And I think you can see it. I hope you can can see it. I'm not sure if you could see it. Um, um, uh, Ellen made um, some drawings of the, so we tried with this same sample, the same section made by Tima to uh, use the different um, uh, techniques. Uh, this is the drawing. This is a photograph through the Van Leeuwenhoek microscope. Um, this is a crop from that image. Eh? So this is the whole image, but I cropped it a little bit to show the extreme resolution of these uh, uh, microscopes. And with, uh, with the proper lighting, you can just see the hexagonals. Uh, but if you're looking through the microscope yourself, these are the smallest details. They're very tiny. So you need, need very good eyes to be able to, uh, to see those details. And we, we think that um, these micro microscopists have had very good eyes. And they were relatively young. So if you're younger, uh, 30s, perhaps you ha have better eyes. And this is with a modern microscope. So see the difference? This is with the Van Leeuwenhoek microscope, uh, 87 times, something like that. Uh, and this is with a modern microscope. Uh, so Pretty okay, yeah? Um, so this is the, uh, the mouth part. You s also see the little hair. The funny thing is, in the drawing of Swammerdam, you could already see it. You see little hairs on the bee, but if you look more carefully, it's not a hair, it's almost like a feather. And there are so many things in these drawings, you have to look at it for days, months, to see, and every time you see new, de see new details, and that's the good thing about making drawings. If you would look at this, you would see a lot, but if you would have to make a drawing, you are forced to observe. Eh? You, you observe, and every, the more you look, the more you see. You only see what you know, of course. Eh? So the more you look, the more you see. And this is with a modern microscope, but I think this is, Detail-wise, this is so incredibly good. Okay, and then we um, have the plan to observe the, the queen bee and look at the ovarium, the reproductive uh, organs. And as you can see, um, so this is a project of six years, and it would, of course, be fantastic if we would already succeed in the first week to make beautiful pictures of this uh, Queen bee ovarium, but I think we still have some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you very much. Thank you so much for these beautiful images. Um, 
let's go to the other side of the spectrum, I think, of this research project. Um, Dirk van Meert, uh, the brand new director of the Huygens ING, uh, is going to talk to us about uh, this kind of research and the Republic of Letters. I'm afraid. So let's see if we can swap this one. Do check your uh, devices. This will this will cost uh, a while. So yes, thank you, uh, everybody. Let's switch this one on. Am I at all audible now? Is this fine? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. We're running a bit late, um, so I'd like to hurry up. I'm, we'll speak about the Republic of Letters, which is the sort of scientific community, so I'll be focusing a bit out, zooming a bit out of the subject. 
I also want to do so for the, um, in order to address the epistemological um, consequences of this project uh, beyond just microscopic uh, research, but also uh, its relevance for, uh, for studies in history and in the humanities. Now, um, this is not working, apparently. I see that the battery is finished. <laughs> Is this the one? This is the one? Yeah, here we are. Right, cool. So we speak a great deal about the production of facts, actually, in the history and the philosophy of science. And there are also books written about how facts are being constructed, that facts are not obvious, that they have an origin and a history, and that they might be constructed because people uh, have consensus about what, what makes a fact, right? And that facts are always also... Um, contested. And I've been thinking about facts as well in a, in a volume I published a, a number of years ago uh, about communicating observations in letters uh, in the period we are speaking about. Is it not on? Oh, right. I'm not available. Well, I can speak from here. That's fine. So, one of the, one of the things which um, uh, the problems which these, 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 these early modern scholars were facing in communicating their observations was how to inspire trust, right? How to authorize their observations. And one thing is also always there, it's autopsy. That's the prime thing. I saw it with my own eyes. That's the most important argument, right? But very often they relied on second-hand observations. And then they relied to other things. Okay, my intermediate person is diligent and he's trustworthy. So he's accurate, but he is also morally trustworthy, so to say. And these are the two aspects which time and again crop up. Doesn't matter if you speak about ethnological observations or microscopic observations or philological observations. Now, for the philological observation, I want to take you back to France, um, to 2009. In the middle of France, uh, this little, little town, Chantemille, uh, I was looking there uh, on a holiday for this castle, and I eventually found it. This is a castle where resided a 16th century scholar whose correspondence I was, being, uh, I was publishing at the, at the moment. And I was very curious to find out uh, what the place looked like where he had resided. And I was looking in the garden, and in the garden I saw this, uh, this stone. And I was immediately fascinated because I know that this person I was uh, studying collected these kinds of inscriptions. So, uh, so here we have something, and it's barely readable. We see DM et men et pompa, and then something else. So the funny thing is, I went to his archive here in Leiden, the special collections in Leiden University, and this is his notebook, and here we see um, the image. So he actually stood before the same stone 400 years before I did, annotating it and making a very crude representation of that object um, in this sense. And, you know, what did he do with it? Well, he let it publish by a friend of his. So he sent his notebook over to a friend of his who collected these things uh, from other scholars as well, and he published that in this uh, early 17th century edition. So here we have the same um, image again. And uh, now with some, you know, also with some context about that, how it was, you know, uh, how that stone came to be at the place where it was. And it also indicates a source, it's from Scaliger. So a uh, note, you know, the way this, this is sort of drawn, uh, if you compare that to this very crude drawing, this was where he drew from, and this is all interpretation, right? And this is the way it acts, you know, in the authoritative text. Right, it's a completely different thing from the original. Now, and this is the uh, the modern critical edition of the same uh, of the, of the same uh, uh, text. So here it has, you know, again it repeats the context. It also says that a guy called Bohm uh, uh, in vain he looks for it in 1780, which is funny because I was there in 2009 and just saw it. And then here's a critical apparatus saying like all the other editions, what people made of it, and all the differences. And here. It says that Beaumanil had a different uh, abbreviation, and it tried to solve the abbreviation. So, now at that castle, they also sold this a postcard with this image on it, with the letters painted in. 
And that's also a way of manipulating the actual original object, of course. So if you put them all together, um, I was standing here reading nothing. This is what Scaliger wrote, uh, uh, annotated, the guy I was studying. This is what his correspondent made of it, and suddenly there appears an A here. This is what the critical edition says, well, Scaliger had that and not that. And this is what the actual original says, VP. So it's another thing, right? Who is correct here? What is the scientific philological fact here? I don't know, right? And it's because our images depend on photo, they depend on perspective, they depend on light and, you know, and manipulation of that. And there's a whole string of interpretations going on there. So, um, and thus, you know, this is the accepted scientific uh, text. Now, the interesting thing is this, the critical apparatus. Because when I was making the correspondence of this, uh, of this person, uh, this guy, Scaliger, you were confronted with, I was confronted with different versions of the same letter. And what do you do if you make an, uh, an, uh, you know, an, a modern um, edition? You annotate, you write, transcribe the text, you make, you know, uh, paragraph deficiencies, you make explanations, and you draw up a critical apparatus. The critical apparatus is essential. It basically gives you an, an insight into the genesis of a text. So the text is basically my image of an original object, right? This is my scientific image, my handling of the original object. And this is the differences between the different sources I was handling. I merged them into one text, but I gave insight into the black box of my interpretations and my choices by the critical apparatus. So a good scientific text lists that kind of procedure. But this is basically, you know, this project made me think like, yeah, my edition is basically also a sort of scientific interpretation, a, an image, so to say, of an original, of an original object. And this is, the, uh, this is the key. This is what brings you into that very process. So what was going on? you know, between the presented published image and the actual object. And this is what people do, what scientists do, right? This is the record. So that's a scientific method. Now, if I would ask somebody else to draw up the, to make the, an edition of the same text, you will get a different text. Everybody knows this. You will get a different apparatus. That person will make different text. That means that my scientific text is not reproducible, right? If you replicate that experiment, so to say, you'll get a different text. And there's a reproducibility crisis going on in science. And it's not just in, uh, in sociology or psychology. It's basically also in this type of you know, very philological, um, philological uh, research. So, you know, and that made me really think about, you know, about, about you know, how do you you know, that every image and every text is always an interpretation. And that is a bridge to the macroscopic uh, view, which I want to present in the second half of this talk. So we speak about observation, about representing the observations, about communicating them. But what happens in the reception of that, in the interpretation and in the circulation of those images? Now, I'd like to view at the correspondence networks of Swamadam and Leeuwenhoek from the presupposition that, you know, if you look at those networks of their correspondences, you might be able to say something about their potential influence of what they were writing about, with whom they were writing, and they, these correspondents might, be, have, might have shared that with, with other people. Now, first we can look at uh, networks um, of these people in the terms of a first degree network. So Swamadam, we have now 172 letters exchanged with 16 different persons. That's the first degree network. Leeuwenhoek, slightly more, letters 282 with 47 uh, peoples. That's the first degree network. What does this first degree network look like in practice? It looks like, um, like this. So this is uh, Swamadam. Oh my god, this is, why is it not accepting this image? Mm. No, I think it uh, meant it occurred when I skipped right from the. Yeah. Yeah. 
What if I uh, replug it? Might yeah, sometimes maybe. help. Yeah, here we are. So this is Swamadam's correspondence, um, the first degree network, and you can immediately see with uh, who his main correspondents uh, were here. And this is Lewinuk's first degree uh, network. Uh, you can immediately see with whom he was corresponding. These blue dots are people, and you see here a very important uh, correspondent, Royal Society. Um, so this is, you know, tells you something uh, but not that that much, uh, really. There's a great deal more here to uh, to tell, and let's um, let's see if we can um, 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 see see a bit more here. What's what's going on? Because um, Swamadam's 16 correspondence exchanges how many letters with how many people. That was really what I was interested in, and that was what we call the second degree network, right? Uh, but how do you map that if you don't have the data? Now, what I've been doing in my own research project is look at a, a reference corpus, which is called the, ca the Catalogue of Dutch Letters, the Catalogus Epistolarum Neerlandicarum, which is a meta-catalogue listing um, the letter holdings of 11 Dutch libraries and archives. So there are uh, over a million records in that, referring to 2 million individual letters. But luckily, the early modern period, in which I'm interested, only has... Uh, 65,000 records, which refer on to 155,000 uh, letters. So some of the records uh, refer to multiple letters. Now, this is very useful as a reference corpus for Dutch correspondents like um, Swammerdam and uh, Lewenhoek, because they, you know, you would, they were working in, in a Dutch, uh, Dutch context. Now, um, the second degree network of Swammerdam um, those 16 correspondents exchanged 400, almost 500 letters with about 80, 80 people. And the interesting thing here is that you can actually visualize that, um, that as well. Um, and that, then you get this visualization. This is a second degree network. Um, here is Swamadan. Here is Old, Henry Oldenburg with whom he corresponded. And here's Christian Huygens and there's no letters there. Right? So we know, anybody familiar with the correspondence would know that. I never read Swamadam's correspondence, but I now learned this from the metadata. Right? I also learned that there's no direct contact with, uh, with Leeuwenhoek, and I now know why, because you said something about, uh, about these two. And it's very hard to find Leeuwenhoek here in this, uh, in this visualization, but he's somewhere, uh, somewhere there in, in between uh, people. There's interesting uh, sort of loops going on with Teveno corresponding with Christian Huygens, corresponding with Henry Oldenburg and, and back again. So you can imagine that these people, you know, there's some inflammation, information circulation potentially going on um, between these people. So this is a second degree uh, network of, uh, of, of Swammerdam. Now, I tried to do the same thing for, uh, for, um, uh, for Leeuwenhoek, and that was a lot, uh, a lot more uh, difficult. But there's you know, a number of conclusions. There's only one letter from Leeuwenhoek to Teveno, and Swammerdam was far better connected to this very important French knowledge uh, uh, broker. So, you know, was Swammerdam's visual language then perhaps also more influential in France than Leeuwenhoek? That's, something, that's a question which, 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 which comes up with me. So what, is, what do I do? I use the image as a way to think with the data. I'm not saying that they present any answers to questions, but it's a way to explore uh, the data. And these visualizing data sets, uh, you know, that is basically, you use it as heuristic, heuristic tools. Now, if we do the same thing for, um, um, for um, um, Leeuwenhoek, you know, he corresponded with only three times more people than Swamadam, and his surviving correspondence is one time point six the size of Swamadam's. But those 47 correspondence exchanged 13,000 letters, over 13,000 letters, with more than 2,000 people. So his second degree network is much, 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 much larger. In fact, I couldn't actually put this network in the same visualization tool because it crashed all the time. So I had to use a different one or actually my people had to use the different the Geffy uh, correspondence. So, and this immediately shows why his second degree network is so large, but because it's Christian Huygens and Concert and Huygens. This is, this is Leonuk 
you know, uh, corresponding uh, um, with them, who have very large, so it's, he has these powerful friends who are very influential, right, which Swamadam, uh, Swamadam didn't have. So, you know, that makes it, um, and here you can sort of, you know, zoom, zoom a bit in with the tool, um, and you can see how important the Huygenses are, which I really like on the first day as director of the Huygens Institute. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, this is a visualization of the entire uh, data set. So this is Constantin Huygens, Christian Huygens, and here is, uh, here is Leeuwenhoek. Right. And you can do all sorts of centrality measures with it. I won't bother you with, uh, with all that uh, today. So the second degree network of Leeuwenhoek is, um, you know, uh, 25 times larger when it comes to actual uh, 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 correspondence and 27 times larger when it comes to actual letters exchanged as far as survived and as far as recorded in this catalogue as a reference corpus, which is just letters kept in Dutch archives. So the conclusion could be that Leeuwenhoek's potential impact, if he used those people, those is much larger than Swammerdam's. So, and this is also a way to visualize the unknown. And what do I mean with that? Well, this is data. This is prepared data, right? This is, you prepare your data for a microscope, but you also prepare your data for a visualization like, like this. You structure your data, right? But what is it that I'm looking at? I cannot interpret this as a human being. So I come up with visualizations, and these are ways to visualize. These are tools to visualize, and you can imagine there are different ways of doing that. So here I have two different visualizations. One is from the Epistolarium, um, developed 10 years ago by the Huygens Institute with Swammerdam, and this is note code, the other one, you know, also with the same people there, but it's a different language, a different visual language which helps you to interpret uh, the data. So, and that also, you know, this project of yours made me think that this is also a scientific image, an epistemic image to think with the data, and every image can be different, uh, but the sources are the same, right? It's just the way you approach the sources, and in between this visualization and those actually library you know, holdings, there's a whole string of interpretation going on with me and my fellow um, uh, um, you know, uh, scientists who did all this fantastic uh, graph work uh, for this uh, presentation. I'm really uh, very grateful to my team members, Liliana and Ingeborg, for that. So, and that was really what made me think, you know, we are visualizing the unknown with these type of visualization tools because nobody knows about these second degree networks. That's, nobody has ever seen this because it's very difficult to see, right? It's something, it's too big to see. Things can be too small to see, but also too big. So I have to reconstruct it and model it, and then you know, present one interpretation of those of those data. And this was you know one interpretation of the republic of letters and the potential circulation of knowledge within that. So with that, I'd like to uh, end with uh, maybe it's time to visualize the very well known, which is uh, which is which is this. But maybe there are questions. Let me check if there are questions online. I can be sent, no, not yet. Um, so before we go to the drinks. I have a question, a general question about the use of um, um, the original microscopes and also, of course, the related uh, microscopes at UTEP uh, in considering to consider them and if you use where it goes. The question is, are you considering to use the original microscopes here and at the Utrecht uh, University Museum? I just had a look at Paul Lambers, who's also present here, the curator of Utrecht University. He nodded yes, so yes, we will be <laughs> using this. But yes, in fact, uh, we have to, we can never select or entirely right or all the microscopes, so we have to make choices. Uh, and I have to say, uh, in the pilot two years ago, Wim and I were very surprised that the Leeuwenhoek microscope we use now 
that it's so usable to say. It's, it has an 80 times magnification, which given Leeuwenhoek's oeuvre is rather low, but it, may, it, it, it should be able to resolve a bacteria, we think. Of course, once we focus on bacteria, which will be in March, um, which we, in, for which we also will involve many other experts like Leslie, who's present here, um, I think at that time, if we can borrow the Leeuwenhoek, the, the, the strongest Leeuwenhoek microscope, yes, for the sake of comparison, also with the low magnif magnifying ones, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Timon. Um, no questions yet online. Any other here? Yes. More, more suggestion. Um, so we have seen this uh, explanation of the way you look at microscopes and the experiment of microscopes and the last presentation of Jared. You have the kind of network of the people involved and the key players in this kind of observations in the 17th century. But uh, it's also a very good opportunity to bring this to these two worlds together. And um, I was just talking about it with uh, Amit that is now a new project in, uh, in England, which is called Tools of Knowledge. And that brings the information together of Cambridge um, and is done in a linked data way. Um, in the past, there have been some experiments with uh, the Museum of Galileo, for instance, and also the Hybrids has had, of course, a database that's compiled by, by, by Hybrids Hybridify. But this is actually a kind of new moment that you can use to bring all that different sort of data together because you see the very different data. You have your experiments which are almost physics, then at the same time you have kind of analysis of Republic of Letters, as we have seen in the, in the presentation of Dirk. You have the kind of interpretation of images, so you have all sorts of different ways of looking at this kind of data. And uh, you have to find new paradigms also to bring that together again. And I think this could be an opportunity at least. Uh, and I don't know whether Sitzke and Nordschutz people, because the, 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 actually the Whitby collection and others are involved in that tools of knowledge project. Chance at least they are actually starting, like you are starting now in this in this fall. There's a in autumn they are starting, so you're more or less running at the same time as that you're running this project, and it could be perhaps a possibility to see whether you can work together. So for our audience online, it's the suggestion is to combine uh, tools and databases from different projects and very different approaches yeah, to so subjects. So and uh, that's, I think, the point of the link data format allows that. And then you can also do the kind of analysis as a So, Sitzke, would you like to elaborate on that? I will very briefly say thank you, Charles, um, because I, I think I know some of the people involved in uh, in Cambridge, but I actually will look uh, will look further into that because I think it's, a f it's the moment to also do that now from the start. Uh, I mean, it was one of the difficulties also with the Making Visible project in a way that we have this database with all this data and, and in a way, what, 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 what do you then do with that? Yeah. Um, so that would be, um, uh, it's, it's a very good suggestion and um, I can only say... The digital part is done by the University of Sussex with uh, Alex Butterworth. He's right, the, yes. Uh, but many departments are Cambridge and um, uh, the Museum of Greenwich and the Scotland uh, so it's quite a big yeah, that's fantastic. Timon, you want to add something? Just a small addition. Um, as you saw, the visualizing the unknown, it originated during a visit in Cambridge uh, mm -hmm. to Sitzke. At that point, uh, I also spoke to Josh now. Uh, I think a few weeks after the visit, uh, Josh asked if we had interest in being involved in this project, and they, their project got funded, which is great. Uh, so um, they... Well, they know how to find us. We, we will see in further ways into cooperating. Because indeed, the Museum Boerhaave, since the beginning, has been compiling inventories of instrument makers. At a certain point, we realized that the Huygens Institute is the best place to disclose them online. And these are valuable data sets. So yes, it's uh... Thank you, Tim. And one question from Katie, sorry, no last name. Wonderful to hear about this fantastic project. My question for the team is, if there are any methodological hurdles they anticipate with the microlabs doing histor historic reconstructions in the present day. So about methodological hurdles. I think there are many. 
maybe you can give some examples. Sitsko or Timon? Both. We're thinking up a list. Uh, there's plenty of hurdles, epistemological, uh, methodological. Um, we want to work with <clears throat> the original instruments of scholars, and sometimes they don't exist anymore. Sometimes they may exist, <laughs> but we don't know. Um, have, sometimes we have the drawing, sometimes we don't have the drawing. So there is about the, 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 the thing that is missing and that is there. Yeah. But there is also, um, it's the, Go ahead. there is the kind of, um, what you're already mentioning also, there is the embodied knowledge. Like the, so there is not only that we know that we don't have, we know that we have, that certain images are missing, that certain instruments are missing, but there's also information missing that we even don't know that it is supposed to be missing. So there is, and, and how to find that is, is one of the questions. But then I think methodologically there are other things because, you know, we're, we're in a lab format like we've been doing the last week. There is Wim with all his, uh, his most up-to-date, uh, um, uh, call it machinery. Um, and we are having the modern microscope standing there next to the, uh, to the old ones. So um, we're also looking with very biased, a very biased eye uh, set of eyes uh, to the materials, but we're also using instruments that um, that weren't there. So basically, I, we I didn't use them, but it's it's a, it, it are very deliberate choices. It's very difficult to be unbiased, yeah. but prepared enough for this experiment. Exactly. So there is a there is a lot of peeling of the onion, and we don't know yet. We 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 are aware of the fact that we're doing that and that we have to do that, but we are not yet fully aware. Of how all the layers of the onion are looking at this point, I think. Yeah. But there are lessons to draw from other reconstructions experiments, and we're very happy to have these very people, these very experts in our board, yeah. too. Uh, and I think we can say now that we have, 20, just to give a number, we have 20% of the data available that we, of the 100% we would like to have. And we believe, we do believe that through reenactment, through reconstruction, we may add up to 30. So yes, we can tell more about the 17th century, and there's always a lot we cannot tell. Yeah, and, I, and just a, a final note to this: uh, in the the, the reenactment, uh, which which raises a, or which brings a lot of hurdles with it, it's also it's only a part of the entire research we're doing and the way that we are going to find answers. As, as, as Pamela Smith also says many, has said many times, it's one of the tools in the historian's toolbox. And that's really what we're doing now. So yeah, we are using it, but it's, it's part of the bigger methodology to get to these, um, um, to, to the workings of a microscopist. And yes. Yes. One, one final addition to this, because the, the uh, uh, this is a very important question what has been, been posed here. Uh, and what we are basically doing is both reenact, but it's not only reenactment, it's also kind of reverse engineering and deconstructing. So there are two opposite methodological things at play here. It's not, uh, our project is not in the sense a follow up to the way of others have reconstructed or reenacted experiments, we also reverse engineering, deconstructing a picture and see how did they make this picture. So it's kind of met methodological yin and yang or methodologic methodological mess if you want, but it's quite intriguing I think what we're uh, doing with this project. Thank you. Um, I have one question online and then I'll get to you. Um, please take, I think that's easier than walking up and down because Matthew Cobb wants to know about the importance of color. He mentions Malpiri uh, sending a watercolor with his uh, silkworm manuscript and Swammerdam used words to describe colors. What might we have gained or lost, he okay, asks. Yeah, Eric wants to yeah, answer. I'll because I'm very glad that uh, Matthew posed this question. I'm very, very glad that uh, Matthew is on our board. Uh, and at a certain point in time, we will uh, invite Matthew to participate uh, in one of the sessions because he wrote an extremely important book called The Egg and Sperm Race uh, from the pers perspective of a biologist 
who has a very good feel for historical detail. And the question is very relevant, also with regard to the PhD project, because what our people were doing is trying to invent a new visual language in which shading was an aspect, what we saw with Swamardam, the whole kind of uh, uh, what in, in art history is called, uh, 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 how is it called? Um, Continuerende Darstellung, uh, which is a very nice <laughs> term, I think. So time-lapsing methods to kind of uh, show the, 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 the thing. And color is also very important in this respect. And uh, the, the funny thing is that uh, Swammerdam uh, not only communicates via his drawings and in his words, but also in his letters. And here we see um, that he's kind of changing positions. So he kind of experiments with color and then explicitly writes, well, color kind of detracts the attention of the eye of the beholder. In the first, uh, his first works, he uses a black background to kind of highlight the tiny hairs on all kinds of insects. And then later, he rejects the use of black backgrounds. And I don't know if you remember the... The, uh, the, the images, the engravings of the Laos in successive stages that you can see that the black is removed. So to go into uh, Matthew's question, yes, color was definitely an issue, but the whole broader issue of how do we present it, what do we uh, draw, how do we draw it, how do we present it with a shadow or with shading or whatever, it's all in play. And this very much fits into uh, the discussion which is now, uh, now is going on, especially in the circle of uh, historians of art about the whole thing of ad vivum, done after life, which this is also a part of. So, so much for this, and perhaps there are other questions. Yes, I've uh, been instructed to be strict, so <laughs> let's ask one more question. So this is a remark about the importance not just of pictures, but uh, of the specimens behind it from a botanist who is always instructed to always keep the first specimens. What do you think about that, Eric? Um, One well, last I reply. It's very brief because we have, I think, two minutes left before we start drinking. Um, this is a very <laughs> much the part of one part of our um, uh, project uh, work package three called in NWO language, uh, which we are so happy to uh, cooperate with Erma Hermans, who is an expert on the subject. This is exactly the thing we are so much interested in. Because the whole issue here is, when do you know a thing? If you have the actual specimen, or a drawing of it, or uh, what the whole issue is about representation. And the herbaria, you know so very, very well, are a typical example of that. And a herbarium is the thing itself, but exactly in the period we discussing, so around the 60, 50, 60, 60, 60, 70, you see all kinds of experiments to come to the core of the question, when do we 
have a thing, when do we know a thing? If we draw it, if we have to specimen itself, like in the case of present-day botanists, if we make a nature print of it, if we make a wax model of it, and this is an extremely interesting and highly intriguing question because it is very much at a kind of theological process in which we take the existence as drawing, as the image, as a carrier of significant knowledge as the ultimate thing, but in the period under discussion, and Erma knows far more about this than I do, uh, the whole thing is in flux. So to come back to your question, for present day botanists, it would be uh, relevant to have the actual specimen, but to 70th century botanists, it would basically not matter if you got a description of it, if you got a print, nature print made of it, if you got a good uh, drawing, afterlife, not afterlife of it, it's all in flux then. So it's more complicated. Our job is to make things more complicated. <laughs> this is just one specific uh, part of it. So thank you for your question. And by the way, we are very open to cooperation with <laughs> your research because it's extremely interesting, of course. Thank you. Um, there are more questions online. I'm going to forward these to the speakers. Um, and I know there are more questions in the room, but luckily this is far from the last meeting for visualizing the unknown. It's only the start. So thank you for everybody here. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you for the speakers. Thank you Rijksmuseum Boerhaven for welcoming us. And well, now let's celebrate, I think, the launch of Visualizing the Unknown. Thank you very much.